So uh, what I want to do today is give you a, a pretty much a final report on the CubeSat project, the UVA CubeSat project. Uh, it's called the Virginia CubeSat constellation because, as you may remember, there are three of them. We'll get to that in a minute. So, uh, yoo-hoo. All right. Pardon me. There we go. Helps if you turn it on. Uh, so, just a reminder: mission objectives. Uh, the the main objective uh, is the objective of the whole CubeSat launch initiative, and what's called Alana, the educational launch of something nanosatellites, something. Um, it's a NASA program uh, that was uh, designed to give university students, but now it's actually been pushed down. There, there's at least one. Um, middle school that has done one of these uh, and a number of high schools have done these th to give university students the chance to actually design and build and fly uh, some sort of satellite uh, rather than just talking about it and doing simulations so that's the primary goal uh, for all three schools this was the first student built satellite uh, project and then the secondary or what uh, NASA refers to as the science uh, portion of the mission, and every mission has to have something, some science uh, goals. Um, in our case, all three of the satellites um, had uh, have uh, very um, uh, fancy GPS receivers and uh, uh, are supposed to be taking uh, position and velocity and acceleration data every couple of minutes and recording that. And the students are going to use that to uh, basically analyze the orbits and look at uh, drag uh, in addition to affecting uh, the HF bands. Uh, you know, when the, 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 uh, the layers move up and down because the atmosphere is expanding and contracting because the sun changes. And uh, so we expect there'll be relatively little drag because there have been no sunspots and very little solar activity. So, uh, so that in low Earth orbit, there's less drag, and we should stay up longer. Um, so there are three satellites, one built here by UVA students, one by Virginia Tech students, one by Old Dominion students. And Hampton is involved in uh, designing the science package. And, uh, and uh, we're originally going to do the data analysis. That's changed. Each of the three universities also uh, implemented a ground station. Uh, a CubeSat, for those of you who don't remember, CubeSat looks a little bit like this. It's a 10 by 10 by 10 is what's referred to as one U or one unit uh, size CubeSat, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. So it's, this is, these are tiny little things. You can hold them in your hand. And, um, but you can do a whole lot uh, with miniaturized components. So typical set of stuff, you need batteries, uh, some sort of power management. This would all be wrapped in solar panels that would be used to charge the batteries when, when it's in the sun. Uh, you've got a, a computer that makes everything uh, work. You've got whatever your science payload is. In this case, in our case, it's a GPS receiver. And you've got a radio for talking to the ground. Uh, originally, the mission uh, plan included using uh, low power, what's called LoRa uh, radios. I talked a little bit about that in my Internet of Things presentation. Uh, low power, we're talking about 50, 100 milliwatt here. Uh, 900 megahertz radios to talk between the satellites. The FCC wasn't able to get its mind around licensing uh, uh, low power, low RA in space. And so that got cut fairly early. And the Old Dominion satellite was supposed to have a, an Iridium uh, data radio on it. Uh, and <laughs> we discovered in the first year that the only way to license that, because it was in orbit, not on the ground or on an aircraft, it was in space. The only way to license that was to add it to the Iridium Constellation license, uh, which was, uh, you might guess, a non-starter. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the way these pieces go together. There you go. And then these are the, the old Minion satellite has, has drag brakes. Uh, the others don't. Uh, so they, uh, uh, they deployed their drag, uh, drag brakes 30 days after uh, the satellite was pushed out from the space station. 
and so they will re-enter before the other two do. The, they're, they're expecting to re-enter sometime in the next few months. The rest of us will be up there for a year and a half, something like that. Uh, so that's what they look like. I realized when I looked at this picture today that uh, the, the student who took ours arranged to put it on a little stand, so it's just a little bit higher <laughs> than the <laughs> Tech and ODU satellites. As, as they should. Clearly has a career in marketing. <laughs> um, so they designed and built and orbited a spacecraft, and they did it in the, on the first try, which I think is pretty amazing. So that's the, that's the, that's the punchline. It worked. So, yeah, question. Question. Um, components, do, are, do they have to be radiation hardened? Or do they don't. Know? They don't. It, it's a, that's a great question. So uh, our, our satellite, our CubeSat, was built um, primarily out of commercial off-the-shelf components. Um, but not all of the, so most of the components on ours are, have what's called flight heritage. Uh, they, they have been in space on other satellites before. Uh, but not everything that we sent up, in fact, very little that we sent up is rat hardened. Um, uh, because that drives the cost up way, way high. Uh, our, our CubeSat, each of these CubeSats cost something in the neighborhood of $50,000 uh, in stuff to build. And then, of course, a whole bunch of labor that wasn't accounted for because it was all students. Um, but uh, if we'd gone with Rad Harden, you know, it would have been 10 times that easily. So, uh, so you take your chances. These missions are only going to be a year and a half long, uh, and then it's going to re-enter and, and turn into plasma. And, uh, and so you take your chances. You go with stuff that's not Rad Harden, uh, and you worry about vibration and, and thermal stuff. and and you cross your fingers and hope you don't get, get smacked with something in a critical location. Uh, so uh, this will, I'm going to give John the slides. He'll put them on the site. If you want to see these names, you can look at those later. But basically, they were uh, design, construct, and operate teams. Uh, the, this is all design over here. Design work started in 2016. This is done uh, at UVA, done by uh, Chris Goines' spacecraft design class. It's the it's the capstone, senior capstone, uh, two semester um, class for uh, the aerospace engineering students at UVA. And so, uh, uh, construction started in earnest in mid 2018. We, uh, integration is where we hand off the CubeSat to the company that makes the deployment device. Uh, that happened in Houston at NanoRacks uh, near the Johnson Space Center <clears throat> in uh, March. And uh, we installed the ground station in, on the mechanical and aerospace engineering building about the same time. Uh, we launched in uh, April, and that was a lot of fun. And then uh, we went on cargo to the space station. So we went up on a, uh, on a Northrop Grumman Antares uh, launch uh, in the Cygnus cargo module up to the space station and then got scheduled based on all of the other stuff that the astronauts have to make time to do. And as you might imagine, deploying CubeSats isn't the top of the list. So we sat up there for about three months uh, in the closet waiting for them to have time to do the deployment. Um, the, the deployment device consists of a bunch of um, tubes that have a spring at the back and a door at the front. And uh, you can put up to four 1U CubeSats in there or any combination up to 4U. Uh, most of the CubeSats that go up are 1U. There are a fair number of threes. Uh, Occasionally, something bigger than a three, but not very often. Uh, so uh, our three were in one tube on their own. And it's very simple. They open the door uh, by remote command, and the spring pushes them out. Uh, nothing very complicated. Yeah. Oh. And uh, uh, this, this was probably more complicated, getting the antenna array onto the roof of the building. Uh, which only has a, a wall mount steel ladder and a, and a hatch that's about that big at the top. So getting the antenna ray onto the building, which is 20 feet tall and incredibly fragile, was quite a challenge. 
Um, and I put this on here just because it's cool. Three, two, one. Can we have engine ignition? And we have liftoff of the Antares NG-11 mission to the ISAF engine at full power. Attitude is nominal. Core pressurization looks good. Power systems look good. Stable operation, full power, both engines. Core pressure looks solid. Attitude is nominal. TVC is nominal. So everything was nominal, which is, of course, you know, NASA talk for normal, working properly. We were about, we were about two miles that way from the launch, and it was an experience. I had never been to a shuttle launch. Which, I'm sorry. Where was the launch? Oh, I'm sorry. It launched from uh, NASA Wallops. So it's uh, over on the Atlantic coast, on the, on the Delmarva Peninsula, almost up to the state line on the on the Delmarva. Uh, so we were a couple of miles from the launch site. At, that's the closest they let any uh, civilians get. And um, uh, there was <laughs> one of the there was a big, big warm up. There were they they said we were VIPs. There were about two thousand VIPs. So. <laughs> uh, and they crammed us all into the high school auditorium in the nearby town. And uh, and sort of put on a show to warm up, warm us up for the launch, make sure we got it. Felt like we'd gotten our money's worth, and uh, uh, most of it was pretty deadly. But uh, but there was one VP for Northrop Grumman who clearly needs to change careers and become a stand-up comedian. He was he was a hoot. But uh, a couple of launches before this, they had uh, the rocket blew up on the pad. And, uh, and and so he said, so you're going to hear a countdown. It's going to go five. Four, three, two, one. But the rocket's not going to take off when you get to zero. It's going to be a few seconds. So start counting three, four. If you get to five and the rocket hasn't started moving, turn around and plug your ears. <laughs> so he was, he was pretty funny. Um, so uh, it was a perfect launch and rendezvous with the space station. And uh, then in, on the 3rd of July, this happened. This is the NanoRax deployment device. As you can see, they've got it configured for eight tubes. So they could have uh, deployed as many as 32 um, 1U satellites uh, on this particular mission. Um, I think there were maybe 15 or 18, something like that, that got deployed uh, this time, so it wasn't full. Um, this is the Japan arm. <clears throat> which uh, so they put the they put the nanorax uh, dispenser in an airlock, and then they open the outside and they swing the Japan arm over and grab it and uh, hold it out, and they uh, deployed um, anti grade. So the this is the direction of travel of the space space station, um, and they pop out of there at uh, it's not super fast, you know it's it's. 10, 15 meters per second, something like that. It's not really very fast. So, but you, you pretty quickly get a good size separation from the space station. But you're basically in the same orbit as the space station. Not, not exactly. Uh, you're going faster, so you're lower a little bit. But, uh, but it's not dramatic. Um, and this is kind of fun to watch too. So, so this is us in the middle. The one uh, that started doing gymnastics as soon as it came out is Virginia Tech. <laughs> and the one that we're desperately trying to bump into is ODU. Um, as best we can figure, the Tech uh, satellite got, there was a little bit of friction on the way out, and, and that's what caused it to tumble like that. <clears throat> there was an astronaut uh, in the, that, I forget what they call it, the observation thing with a, like a, a you know, Canon camera with her finger on the, on the shutter release, just taking pictures as fast as it would take, a, take them, and we uh, stitched them together into a movie. Uh, so then what should have happened? Well, within the first few days, we should have established two-way communications. There's a, 
There's a silent period for, I think, 30 minutes after deployment where you're not allowed to turn the spacecraft on. They don't want it to blow up right next to the space station. Um, and, uh, and so we waited our 30 minutes, and there's, it, it all happens automatically, so our, our CubeSat presum CubeSat's presumably powered up. So we should have made first contact. We had a pass that was about, so the, the it, it was interesting, so it's the Japan arm. So uh, the deployment was controlled by the Japanese space agency, JAXA, uh, in Tokyo. I think they're in Tokyo. Uh, so it, it was really early in the morning for us and really late for them. I think it was, 5.30 or something like that in the morning here. Um, but they arranged it so the deployment was over Virginia, pretty much. So uh, about an hour and a half later, we had a pass. Each orbit is about an hour and a half. So about an hour and a half later, we had a pass over Virginia, and we should have been able to make contact. Uh, what actually happened? Nothing. Not good. No contact with ours. Libertas, no contact with Eternitas, no contact with Veritas. Uh, so we were wondering what's going on here. Uh, Chris Goyne, who's uh, an Aussie, has uh, uh, a colleague at a university in uh, Australia who's a, uh, an astronomer and has a planetary camera which also is really handy for taking pictures of things in low Earth orbit. And he said, can you swing your camera around and see if you can see our CubeSats, please. And he did. And there's Libertas right there, uh, right where it was supposed to be. By this time, the Air Force, or not Air Force anymore, I forget what it's called. Space Force. J JP SOC, the joint. <laughs> it's Space Command is what they used to call it. Now it has a, an unpronounceable acronym. Uh, but anyway, it was right where they were supposed to be. Uh, we just couldn't talk to them. But then about 10 days after deployment, uh, we were all asleep. We we decided we weren't going to stay up all night again. We'd stayed up every night because at the time that, you know, because of the rotation of the Earth, uh, these these orbits precess, basically. And so, you know, for a while, they're in the afternoon, and then they're in the evening, and then they're, we get two or three or four passes a day. But the time of day changes in a cycle. And, um, and so we'd been, when they deployed us, it just so happened the passes were in the middle of the night. So we'd been up in the middle of the night for a week uh, with no success. We decided to get some sleep. And so, uh, yeah? Can you physically see those things, say, with a telescope? Uh, no, you wouldn't be able to see it with, with a backyard telescope. If you had a big telescope, you'd be able to see it. But, you know, just a dot. I mean, that's about the best yeah, you're going to do. You can, once in a while, you can get, I get an email about the uh, ISS coming yeah. across. Yeah. You can yeah. see the yeah. ISS. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, ours is, <laughs> ours is that big. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I know that. I ISS is that. just a little bigger. With a telescope. Yeah. And ours are just they're not terribly shiny either. Oh, okay. You'll, um, so I forget uh, what the aperture on on this guy's telescope is it's it's pretty big you know it, I, I'm not sure but it's probably you know that kind of telescope it's a serious telescope so anyway about ten about ten days afterward the folks at tech who uh, um, are more stubborn than than our team uh, they were still staying up all night trying to talk to theirs and and my phone rang at about four o'clock in the morning and um, and they said, Mike, 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 we think we heard your, your satellite. And uh, sure enough, they had. They had caught. So we're, we're communicating uh, on UHF 401.040 megahertz. We're operating under an experimental license for reasons I'd be happy to talk about if anybody's interested. Um, the, uh, we're uh, using AX25 uh, packet. So it's basically the same stuff that we use for APRS and WinLink and all, all the other packet stuff we do, except we're using the high-speed version, the 9600 baud version. Um, and so uh, we got this phone call in the, at 4 o'clock in the morning saying they thought they'd heard our satellite. They, they got a valid, in fact, two valid AX25 packets. 
and uh, and they decoded them. And in the AX25 header, they decoded the header, and the header was our call sign. And so I said, well, send me the packets. That's great. Send me the raw data. And I, uh, all of our packets are uh, digitally signed. They're they're signed using a digital certificate that only a couple, the, the satellite has a copy and a couple of us on the ground have a copy. So unless the other guy at UVA who knows what the secret word is was sitting in the parking lot with a radio pretending to be our satellite, we in fact have, are virtually certain that those packets came from our satellite. They, they verified. They were ours. They were acknowledgments. They were ACT packets. Uh, there were two of them, so this is ours right there. This is the Virginia Tech ground station transmitting over here. And this is some other satellite. We never did figure out what it is, uh, but it's definitely not ours. Uh, it, it's transmitting some other modulation that's very different from packet. Uh, so we got two packets, and there was another one in between that we weren't able to decode that I'm almost certain uh, was ours because uh, this was packet number two. Every packet has a sequence number. Uh, this was packet number two. We decoded packet number four. The one in the middle's got to be three. So we heard three packets from our satellite. And then for months, we heard nothing. We kept listening, kept trying to communicate, heard nothing. So just a quick reminder, you've got software to put pa for to do packet assembly, disassembly, all that sort of stuff. We're using a software-defined radio uh, at, uh, at us Research, which now belongs to National Instruments, uh, USRP N210, uh, with uh, an RF daughter card called the UBX40. Uh, a software-defined radio, for those of you who don't remember, basically you've got uh, an RF front end. On this one, uh, it can work up to 6 gigahertz. You've got an RF front end that uh, that drops everything down to an IF frequency. It's not low, as low as the IF on our HF rigs, but it's something that you can process with uh, electronics that mere mortals can afford. Um, and then it's immediately digitized. And everything else happens in software. And, um, and then antennas, uh, low noise preamplifiers, because the signals coming down from space are weak. Uh, the radio on the satellite, on the CubeSat's only running uh, a watt or so. Uh, with a little rip antenna, and so and then big antenna arrays. Uh, so what ended up happening? It took us a long time to figure this out. But what ended up happening? We had a problem with the with the RF front end. So this is the RF front end, uh, a very densely popula populated surface mount board. There's a preamp chip in there, which nominally it. Uh, 400 megahertz gives you about 22 dB of gain. Uh, what we determined through extensive testing was that, in fact, we were down here, uh, about almost 60 dB down from where we should have been. And the reason we didn't catch it right away was, of course, you know, no surprise, we tested the radios on the bench. We have a, we have a, a backup copy of the radio that's on the CubeSat. And we have a processor that can do what the CubeSat's supposed to be doing. And, uh, and in fact, we were able to communicate with the ground station radio. Uh, so I assumed it was working right. It never occurred to me that a component would fail in a way that made it deaf, but not stop working entirely. Right? It just turned the preamp into an attenuator. It was a, an interesting failure mode. Those of you who understand what's going on inside that chip might tell me, well, of course that's the way it fails, Mike, you dummy. So uh, one of my favorite quotes from Hunt for Red October. So, you know, we could have had Voice of America up on our satellite and we wouldn't, wouldn't have heard it. So we sent it back to be repaired. That took a long time. In the meantime, uh, we had from the beginning intended to uh, uh, network our ground stations together so we could provide backup for each other in case we had a failure. Well, we ended up using it. Uh, so we uh, had to modify our license with the FCC to allow us to do this. And over the internet, through a virtual private network, we connected to the radio and the antenna array and the tracking software uh, down in Blacksburg and tried to communicate with our 
satellite, and on the first try, we got it. So in fact, it was that radio that was the problem. Again, they called me and woke me up, but I was happy they did. So uh, we got successful two-way communications with Libertas. Uh, first contact was on the 23rd of November. Uh, the last contact we made was on the 29th of December. We worked a total of 11 passes. Uh, we only worked 11 passes, uh, even though there were many more that we could have worked. We only worked 11 uh, because we discovered that probably the GPS receiver isn't working. It's supposed to be taking position, velocity, acceleration every couple of minutes, storing it on an SD card, and then when we asked for it, sending that data down to us. And when we finally made contact, we said, how many, uh, how many science payloads do you have available to send us? And it said, zero. <laughs> and, uh, and we did some resets and tried to get it working again, and, and we just can't get, the, we can't get it to take data. So <clears throat> all we can do is ask it, how you feeling now? How you feeling now? How you feeling now? <laughs> which after a while feels like a waste of time. So uh, we worked you know, a couple of passes a week uh, for a while uh, just, to, just to make sure it was still working. Yeah, Ed? Mike, if the problem was the low noise amplifier on the ground station here in Charlottesville, right? Yeah. So how come in the beginning the other universities in the consortium were picking up so we don't know yet. Uh, neither of them has made contact with their, their CubeSat. Um, and, uh, and we don't know for sure. The folks at Tech have, uh, they've got a theory. I'm not sure this is where they still, what they're still thinking, but they have a theory that they've sort of been able to replicate on the ground with, with their, their ground test hardware. Uh, that they think they might have a power cycle kind of problem that where they've gotten into a, a, a kind of an infinite loop trying to power up the satellite. Uh, the, as far as I know, uh, the ODU folks have, haven't expressed, a, a, haven't articulated a theory about what's wrong with theirs. Uh, but uh, neither of them has been able to make contact, unfortunately. Once you solved the preamp problem, you were pretty successful. Right? Ours worked fine, yeah. Yep. Uh, until the 29th, and I'll tell you what happened then in, in a second. So we got a total of tw uh, 244 uh, telemetry packets from the satellite. Uh, most of them, uh, what we refer to as health or housekeeping, so it's temperatures, uh, um, things like uh, what's the voltage on the 12, or the current draw on the 12-volt bus, what's the voltage on the 12-volt bus, what's the temperature on the motherboard, uh, stuff like that health of, and welfare of the satellite. And all of these numbers are, are nominal. They're all, it, it appears to be working the way it's supposed to, except for the GPS receiver. Um, one of the interesting things that the students are working on, because uh, we know with, with a, a high degree of precision what the orbit is, the, the Space Command folks have spectacular tracking capabilities, as you might imagine. And they're telling us uh, several times a day they update the orbital parameters of everything that they're tracking. So we know pretty much right where this thing is, even though our GPS receiver isn't working. And, um, and we get information on uh, basically the amount of energy that's falling on each of the solar panels. There are uh, four sides, and there's another solar panel on the bottom. And so the students are working on figuring out uh, what the roll rate is we should be able to figure out the roll rate. So we're in orbit like this, going around the Earth. These things running the length of the z-axis on the four corners are what are called magnet torquers. They're passive attitude control devices. There's a magnet and there's a ceramic that uh, is magnetically uh, responsive. And the idea is they align the CubeSat with the Earth's magnetic field over time in the X and Y axes. We don't have any control on the, on the, around the Z axis. So theoretically, we're going around the Earth and we're rolling like that. that that's what should have happened. And over the first week or two, uh, we should have gone from tumbling to stabilized in two axes and rolling. 
Uh, and in fact, it looks like we probably are. So the predicted uh, roll rate was about uh, a rotation every four minutes. Uh, uh, from the telescope Im images, they uh, just looking at the brightness change, uh, um, but of course not knowing whether we're still tumbling or not. It was fairly early, so we might have still been tumbling rather than just rolling. They came up with something a little bit under a minute, but you have to take that with a grain of salt because the quality of the data is not great. Uh, the thinking from looking at the uh, irradiation, uh, solar panel irradiation data is that we're probably rolling once every two and a half minutes and that in fact the spacecraft is probably stabilized in two axes, which is what should have happened. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so. NASA, who's been, they've been fabulous trying to help us, uh, help our mission succeed. They said, well, you all can use the 18-meter dish at, at Wallops to try to talk to your, yourself. Yeah, and we said, oh, oh really? Sure, okay, yeah, no problem. Um, <clears throat> it took a while to work out. Lots of security issues, as you might imagine, uh, had to be worked out. Uh, we had to get, again, licensing issues worked out, except this time not with the FCC, because NASA isn't subject to the FCC. Uh, National Telecommunications Information, Information Agency, NTIA, uh, uh, handles all of the federal government uh, satellite radio licensing, space radio licensing. And so we had to work with NTIA and, uh, uh, and get permission to do this. And, uh, and then work through all of the software issues because Wallops had just, uh, they just upgraded their ground station to a brand new software defined radio architecture and they had never done AX25 packet before. So they had to figure out how to do AX25 on their new infrastructure. So uh, on, uh, right at the end of December, uh, all of the ducks were lined up and we tried uh, sending our first packets up to to Libertas from Wallops, <clears throat> and um, and it didn't work. NASA folks went back to the drawing board, looked at what they'd done, and they said, "Up, oh, we made a mistake. We we formatted the packets incorrectly. We're going to try it again. We got it right now." And we sent some students over there with uh, with our ground station backup radio and confirmed that in fact they had built the packet, packets properly this time. And we tried it again, and it still didn't work. So that's the last we've heard. Uh, we, of course, then tried to do the go through Virginia Tech again, which had worked before, and now that's not working. We've tried that a number of times, and it's not working. So we think what's happening is that uh, those packets that Wallops sent the fir on the first try were malformed. They, they were AX25 packets, but they weren't quite right. X, I, I forget, extra byte or a byte missing, one of the two. Uh, and it was something important in the header, AX25 header. And, and we've been able to confirm this on the ground. We, of course, we record everything we send up and everything we receive. And so we were able to replay the packets that NASA transmitted on that first try, the malformed AX25 packets. And by golly, when the satellite, when the radio that's up on the satellite receives those bad packets, it's bricked. Dang. It's done. Uh, so there's a bug in the firmware. That radio has its own CPU, and there's a bug in the firmware someplace, obviously. Now, if you power cycle, cycle the radio, it comes back to life. So it's not permanently bricked. But power cycling the radio isn't something that the main processor on, the, on our CubeSat is going to do under normal conditions. It could happen. So we're going to keep trying, you know, once a week or so, we'll toss some packets at it and maybe we'll get lucky and the, and, and the CubeSat will have decided to reboot for some reason uh, and it may start working again. So we'll keep trying it until, until it re-enters and burns up. But uh, our thinking at this point is we've probably heard the last we're going to hear from it. How long do you think it would take to burn up? Uh, we think it'll be... Uh, about a year and a half from deployment, so you know, a little less than a year, something like that. But it all depends on what the sun does. If the sun all of a sudden gets really active, then it could re-enter sooner than that. Yeah. 
Well, well, wouldn't that benefit ham radio if the sun were to get active? It would. So that'll yeah. never happen. And so, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Pretty okay, much. As, as long as all you move on, it's, it's, yeah. as long as we're all hoping for sunspots, then yeah, we could be up there forever. Yeah. yeah. So are there plans for another one? Oh yeah. So. So our, our plan, our short-term plan is declare victory and move on. Uh, so what's coming up next? We are uh, working with AMSAT uh, on uh, a, a quick and simple mission. This first mission was really pretty complicated, especially when you consider it was the first time for all three universities. And to fly a, th a three CubeSat constellation that we're supposed to talk not only to the ground, but also talk to each other. Uh, and the reason the ODU satellite had the Iridium radio in the first plan was they wanted to, you know, obviously we can only talk to these spacecraft when they're over central Virginia. Uh, the ODU folks, want, because part of their mission objective is to test those drag brakes that they designed and built on theirs, they wanted to be able to get telemetry from theirs right until the point where it vaporized. And so, so the, the Iridium radio was for, was for re-entry on theirs. Um, and so uh, it was a really complicated mission for the first try. Uh, the, um, so we decided here, uh, Chris Gloin decided that what he wanted to do for the next one was, uh, was something that was quick and low risk. And, and I said, well, let's talk to, talk to AMSAT. They do this all the time. Uh, and in fact, AMSAT was quite enthusiastic. They have what they refer to as the Fox uh, radio package. It's a, it's a radio and uh, a management unit, a processor and code that manages the spacecraft. All you have to do is, is provide a frame to put it in and solar panels and a battery and a power management unit. And, and, they, and they were willing to give us one if we could, uh, if we could get a launch. So, uh, so we're working with them on the engineering issues. We've got a team of students here who's working with the folks at AMSAT uh, trying to make it happen. And, uh, and Chris is trying to work out a launch opportunity for us. So we're hoping sometime in the next year we'll be able to, to put, up, put this up. And, uh, and the mission for the, this one is amateur radio. Uh, the, the Fox uh, transponder, it's a linear transponder, so it's uh, I forget how wide the band is, 20 kilohertz or something like that. It's not huge, but uh, uplink on UHF, downlink on VHF. You can do uh, CW, you can do digital. They discourage voice, but uh, there's nothing to stop it. But what you, what you get mostly through these uh, AMSAT transponders is CW and digital. Um, uh, so this is different from the repeater. CubeSats, the so-called easy sats, which are FM repeaters, just like terrestrial repeaters, except they're up there a couple hundred miles. Uh, so these are linear transponders. Um, and then we're working on a, a 3U, so, you know, yay big, uh, which is intended to carry a, an imaging spectrometer uh, that is being designed by the astronomy department. And there uh, are a couple of folks in environmental science who are interested in looking at high resolution measurements of nitrogen dioxide, which is a tailpipe uh, emission component. Uh, and um, right now, they, there are uh, a couple of satellites that are in either high Earth or I think they're in high Earth or orbit. So they're a lot further away. So their resolution is pretty big. They're looking at squares on the ground that are you know, 100 kilometers on a side. Uh, the scientists want to see a kilometer on a side or a half a kilometer on a side pixels. And uh, so from low Earth orbit, you can do that. If your optics are good enough, and, uh, and the astronomy department, we've got folks in astronomy who are really good at optics, and they're, they've figured out how to take uh, uh, an, uh, an infrared spectrometer that was originally designed for a telescope. So the original one is this big honking box bolted to the back of the telescope. They figured out how to compress it to 10 by 10 by, uh, we're going to give them about 15 centimeters, so 10 by 10 by 15 centimeters. Um, it's, it's amazing what they've done. And then, uh, so the idea is we would, uh, the environmental science folks would pick a few cities 
uh, we can't image constantly. The, there's, the data rate's just way too high to image constantly. So they'd pick a few cities and uh, do high resolution imaging over those, those cities whenever we uh, had a pass over one of those cities. And um, they're talking about like LA, uh, Mumbai, you know, big, big cities. And, uh, and the astronomy folks figure that, that they think we can get down to about a half a kilometer resolution. So that's, that would be a, a really big difference. That is looking for funding. We're trying to find grant money to, to, um, to pay for that. The first application to NSF was uh, rejected, but we actually got scored pretty high. So uh, I think there's a good chance that this one will get funded. So those are the things we're working on. This one, uh, this is, again, it will be all amateur radio and UHF, VHF. Uh, the, the imaging spectrometer uh, will, uh, there's probably enough, not enough room to put an amateur radio payload in there as well. So probably that'll be another experimental spacecraft that, that won't, be, uh, won't have much interest to hams. Um, uh, and uh, on that one, we're actually going to go up to uh, S-band, uh, 2.4 gigahertz, and so we can get higher data rate. We'll have about uh, about 10 megabits per second downlink on that one, which we need to to get that high resolution, uh, deep spectral imaging. You know, thousand by a thousand by a thousand deep spectrum. That's a lot of lot of bytes. Mike, quick question. So yeah. the three U is 30 byte. I mean, it's 10 by 10, 10 by, by 30. 30. By 30. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And there are other. Uh, so it takes up eight, it take, four. So you've got room for like one more in one of the. In one of those four unit tubes, right. you could have another one U in there right. if, you, okay. if, if, if they had one uh, waiting for launch. There are. Uh, this, the NanoRax uh, deployer is only one of the options. There are actually oh, okay. several other options. Oh, okay. and, uh, and there's one option that can handle up to six. And, and there have been some 6U CubeSats that have been uh, launched. Okay, um, but NanoRax maxes out at four. All right, so that's, that's my story. Any questions? It's been a blast, and it's been humbling. Um, I've, I've spent four years working on this, and um, I have learned so much. And I mean, that's, that's what I love. Throw me in the deep end. Uh, that's, I just love it. And, uh, you know, I knew, I knew what, what you uh, learned growing up obsessed with the Apollo program. Uh, you know, that's what I knew about satellites and, and space, spacecraft. and, and uh, Basically, I had to spin up and become an expert on, on satellites fairly quickly, and, and it was a lot of fun, very rewarding, uh, incredibly talented students. Uh, I, I just can't say enough about how sharp these kids are. Kids, they're not kids, these uh, young adults are. And uh, it's a lot of fun to work with them. Did you come up to speed from reading textbooks? I did a lot of reading, and uh, um, talked to people. Uh, there's a, a, a guy at um, Virginia Tech who's been very helpful. He's sort of my opposite number down there, except he, I would honestly say I'm his apprentice, apprentice up here at uh, UVA. Uh, Zach, uh, I can't remember his call sign, he's a ham. Uh, really nice guy, he was a grad student at at Tech when this all started, and then they hired him after he finished his PhD. And um, he is a whiz at satellite communications. That's what his PhD was in. And so he now works as a researcher for the what, what they call the Hume Center at Virginia Tech. It's a, it's a research operation that's affiliated with, with Virginia Tech. They do a lot of uh, government contracting. Uh, they, they do classified work. Um, it's a it's an interesting operation. Um, it was the the guy who was chief scientist for the Hume Center until he retired about a year ago was Bob McGuire, who uh, is a a big name in AMSAT. Uh, Bob has been involved in in most of the AMSAT satellites that have flown uh, over the history of AMSAT. So he's a big name in amateur radio satellites. He's also a big name in commercial and military satellites. And uh, Zach works for worked for Bob, 
Uh, so I, I've learned a lot of what I have learned from Zach. He's been uh, a great resource.